okay, stop uh, the dextrose and change that for the proper IV fluid. Notify the healthcare provider or the doctor that this happened. First, complete, complete an incident report because this is a medical error. Is a variance of the routine that can have or okay, give um, undesired consequences to the client. It, it needs an incident report and assess the client, make him a client, you know, assessment. So if you work with this question, your anchors and you have the word first, what do you think should be done first on this? Assess the client. Absolutely. Absolutely. The priority here is to quickly make a focus assessment to determine that this mistake is creating okay, a situation that requires an emergency intervention. Yeah. Once we see that the client probably is going to be stable because the, the difference between the solutions are first. This solution is very hypotonic. This solution in the bag, in the bag, uh, by theory, has similar osmolality than the plasma. Okay, you have an open microphone, mute your microphone, okay. But once this dextrose in water enters to the body, the dextrose, the dextrose, which is the same as glucose, will be transformed in water because the glucose is immediately uptaken by the mitochondria of all the cells of the body and is going to be metabolized to produce ATP and heat so energy, is going to produce carbon dioxide and is going to produce water. Those are the three byproducts of the metabolization of the glucose in human cells. Okay, And uh, for that reason, if you give dextrose in water, you are giving water in water water in water. Okay, your microphone is still open. Okay, and it's very hypotonic. So a given a hydration with this um, substance that is practically water can produce a drop in sodium, can produce a hyponatremia. So the focus assessment should be guided in this sense. And the other possibility, especially in diabetic clients, that these could uh, produce an increment unnecessary. If the patient has deficiency of insulin, can produce an undesired increment in the blood glucose level. That could uh, also be an issue. So we need to do a quick assessment to see if this uh, mistake is producing any problem. Once that we notice the patient is stable, we stop okay, the IV and change to the correct uh, bag. We notify the provider and end the, uh, the writing an incident report. The nurse is caring for a client in the first stage of labor and observe that a segment of the umbilical cord is visible in the vaginal opening after rupture of the client's amniotic membranes. Usually, it, it happens, this prolapse of the cord happens when the membranes break. Which of the following action should the nurse take? We don't see first, next, etc. So we need to probably have only one right answer because we need to look for one right answer. Instruct the client to lie on her left side. Attend to place the umbilical cord back into the uterus. Assist the client to a knee chest position and administer an intravenous tocolytic agent. Tocolytic is the word that we need to know. Maybe some of us don't, don't know, uh, doesn't know uh, what is tocolytic. Tocolytic is a medication that stops the uterine contraction. Okay, so this is a tocolytic. And you need to know that tocolytics are medication used to stop the contraction of the uterus. The client is already in the first stage of labor, so he's already in labor, and even has already the membranes broken. There is no indication in this moment uh, of using a tocolytic agent. Tocolytic agents are used when the patient has, for example, a early pregnancy and have a, a threat of miscarriage, so a, a threat of having a miscarriage. Or tocolytic agents could be used if the client is having a, 
a, a premature labor that should be postponed. Okay, this is the main use of the tocolytic agent. Okay? Tocolytic agents include the calcium channel blockers, includes the terbutaline, terbutaline, and includes the magnesium sulfate. Magnesium sulfate is a tocolytic, it stops the, the contraction. Okay, uh, Nietzsche's position is a position where the woman is going to be placed on her knees, on her knees, okay, on her knees, okay, on her knees, but then uh, it, it, the, the, the chest is going to be against, okay, against, okay, the, the mattress, okay, the mattress, okay, and uh, if the umbilical cord, if this is the uterus, or this is the uterus, and the umbilical, this is the vagina, okay, the vagina, and here's the head of the baby, head of the baby, and the umbilical cord is protruding. The umbilical cord is protruding here. Okay, so you are going to push the umbilical cord back into the uterus. If I say here, I tend to place the umbilical cord back into the uterus, and uh, the other option is to make the client uh, supine, but resting on her, uh, you know, on her left side. No? So it's going to be turn to her uh, left side, no, left side in, 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 in this position. Those are the four options, okay? What is the answer to this question? Which number is the answer? Two. Two. Number two, okay. Oh. If you select number two in the test, you are going to be in a problem. Okay, you need, are going to be in a serious problem with the test because it's oh, absolute is absolute contraindicated. So now it was mentioned it's by free. some of, of some of you of us. We need to uh, you know to talk about this. Okay, uh, the the uterus. Okay, the uterus. Okay, it uh, uh, is uh, in this situation is already partially open, so there is some level of dilation. The 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 baby the baby is is here. Okay, the baby is here, and the baby um, has the umbilical cord. The head of the baby is here, and the umbilical cord. Okay, the umbilical cord uh, is at the moment that the membranes were broken. The umbilical enter here, and then the umbilical cord is protruding here in the vagina. Okay, it protruding here in the vagina, and your umbilical cord should be, uh, you know, connected to the with the placenta, which is the organ that is obtaining the blood and the oxygen that the baby needs to be alive. Okay, and uh, if you the problem here is when the umbilical cord is protruding, is prolapsed here, the head of the baby, the head of the baby is making pressure pressure in the umbilical cord. So now the blood that should be, uh, you know, circulating from the placenta toward the baby, this blood is going to stop here. It's not reaching the baby. So the blood is stopping here. And the baby is going to die, is going to be, a, you know, uh, suffering because, because uh, the blood with the oxygen is not reaching the baby. So the pressure of the presenting part, in this case, the head, is what is producing the problem. If you, as a, remember that this test is a, is an entry level generally test. You, as a new nurse, you are a new, new graduate nurse, okay, introduce your fingers, your fingers here, trying to return the umbilical cord to the correct position inside the uterus. Uh, first, you are going to produce a severe trauma in the umbilical cord because it's not going to enter. There is um, a, the, the head of the baby is engaged there. Second, so you are going to make more harm than benefit. And second, any portion of the umbilical cord that returns here is going to be contaminated by, uh, by the bacteria that is in the vagina. So it's going to produce an infection in the uterus. So that's why option to attempt to place the umbilical cord back into the uterus is a no, no, and is a very bad intervention. Okay. Uh, 
turning the client to the left side is used when there is placental insufficiency without umbilical cord prolapse. That's uh... It is used, for example, in late deceleration. Yeah? In late deceleration. But it is not going to solve the problem that here the placenta is okay. The problem here, the head of the baby, the head of the baby, the head of the baby is compressing the umbilical cord and the oxygenated blood is not reaching the baby. So turning the client to the left side is not going to change this reality, this uh, compression. It's not useful in prolapse of the umbilical cord, okay? There is no benefit in stopping the contraction because you know it's not the contraction what is producing the problem. What is producing the problem is the head of the baby engaged here in the cervix and the pelvis that is compressing the umbilical cord. What we can do is change those arrows. So those arrows that I draw here, those arrows, change those arrows in another direction. I can change those arrows in this direction. If I change those arrows in this direction, so I push this head, if I push this head away, this umbilical cord, the compression will stop. Of course, a doctor or a midwife with expertise can do that with his or her fingers. So fingers can be introduced in the vagina. Let me try to, to, to make longer fingers, okay, and can be pushed ahead of the baby. But a new graduate, you, generalist nurse, you, the test that you will have is said, is legally established, is for new graduated generalist, no OB, no specialist in OB, generalist nurse, a the preparation that receive a generalist nursing new graduate doesn't include this expertise maneuver. This maneuver is very delicate, so you cannot do this maneuver. Maybe in some uh, banks, question banks, you'll find that it is the best maneuver, but it doesn't apply to the ankle because you cannot do this maneuver as a new graduate generalist nurse. So your option is to turn this uterus in the opposite direction. So if you put your the, the mother, okay, with the butt up, okay, in this um this knee position, no, with the butt up in this knee position, okay, in this knee position, okay, the uterus will be turned upside down. I mean, the uterus will be now in this position. You understand? And being the uterus in this position, here comes the vagina, no? The vagina comes here. The head of the baby and all the body of the baby is going to be pushed in this direction by the gravity force, separating the head of the baby of the umbilical cord that is prolapsed, okay? That is prolapsed. So now that separates from the umbilical cord, the blood will flow again. So that's why we place the client in the knee chest position. So be very careful that attempting to place the umbilical cord back is not good. Turning the client to the left is not helping. And stopping the contrasting with the tocolytic aging is not helping. What we can help the client is to put the client in knee chest position because this position will invert the uterus upside down and will move the baby, the presenting part of the baby, this part that is the producing the problem is going to be moved away the umbilical cord. So please have this concept very clear because it is a classical question in your end. Don't fail this question, please. Those are the failures that answer that can, you know, subtract a lot of points from your test. Okay, here we have a bow tie a, a type of question, okay? So let me reduce the size so we can see all the, I think it's enough, okay. Um, it says, nurse note, the client presents with right-sided ptosis 
and facial uh, drooping. Right-sided hemiparesis and expresses aphasia. So what we suspect here is stroke. You know? We suspect here that there is a damage in the brain because we have okay a right-sided uh, um, weakness of the body, including the face, and the patient cannot speak. Uh, obviously, this patient is having the the brain injury, is having the probably a stroke in the left hemisphere that usually is the dominant hemisphere of the client. Clients, adult child reports that the client recently had influenza. So uh, this patient had flu recently. They don't say how, how much recent. Uh, on assessment, a skin is warm and dry, which is okay, is the desired. Long sounds are clear, which is okay, is the desired. But apical pole is irregular. So there is a cardiac dysrhythmia because irregularity of the pulse translate cardiac dysrhythmia. Okay. Uh, considering the age of the client, 79 years old female, okay, this cardiac dysrhythmia associated with a stroke probably, probably is an atrial fibrillation. Because we know that atrial fibrillation is the most common dysrhythmia in all people. Second is the dysrhythmia that produce a very irregular pulse. And third is the dysrhythmia that produce a stroke because send, um, sends um, clots to the brain, embolism. Bowel sounds are active in all quadrant, which is okay. Client is incontinent of urine two times in the inverse department. So it looks like it's a new onset incontinence. Adult child report that the client is typically continent of urine. So it is something new. Okay, the, the client as part of the, uh, the disease is presenting urinary incontinence. Capillary refill of three seconds, which is okay. Peripheral pulses palpable two plus, which is the normal. The normal intensity or strength of the peripheral pulse is two plus. Barrel signs, 97.5, which is okay. Pulse, 126, which is elevated. So this dysrhythmia is associated with increased heart rate. The respiratory rate is normal, and the blood pressure is high, especially the systolic blood pressure. So the client is having a hypertension. Pulse oximetry reading in, on room air is 90%. Is, is low, is low. Not critically low, but is low. Okay, so summarizing, we have a client with a stroke left hemisphere with aphasia and uh, a right hemiparesis. We have a client that uh, is having a, a dysrhythmia, probably an atrial fibrillation with rapid heart rate. And we are having a client that for no well understood reasons have a decrease, not critical, but decrease, okay, auto saturation. And the detail that the neurological event has changed the client's incontinence. continent. Let's see if we can find history and physical. History and physical, here it is. Neurological. History of a stroke two years ago mm, is the second one. Cardiovascular, history of hypertension. Ah, oh, this is the other one that we forgot. The client has hypertension. Uh, of hypertension, atrial fibrillation, hyperlipidemia. Okay, those are all risk factors for a stroke. Gastrointestinal, history of gastrointestinal bleeding two months ago. So we need to be very careful because now the client is in stress and the medication will reproduce in AGI bleeding. Endocrine, history of diabetes mellitus, oh my goodness, for 30 years. A type two diabetes mellitus for 30 years. Okay, so we need to be uh, careful with that. And influenza three weeks ago. The relation of the influenza and the present uh, disease is not clear, but could be 
uh, have a relation with the, the hypoxemia. Let's see. Um, laboratory results, random uh, serum glucose, uh, 76. 76, okay, which is uh, uh, normal. Normal is not considered hypoglycemia, is normal. So the, 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 the blood sugar is controlled. Now, uh, let's see, the nurse is reviewing the client assessment data to prepare for the client plans of care. Complete the diagram by dragging from the choices below to specify what condition is the client most likely experiences. So the first that we are going to do is the center of the bow tie is the condition most likely experiencing. Yeah. Um, two actions that the nurse should take to address the condition. So here, here we are going to choose two actions in the second step of answering this question that should be taken. And the last two parameters the nurse will monitor so for the follow up for the ongoing um, monitorization of the disease to assess the client progress. So the diagnose, this is diagnose. Okay, here we have the assessment. We, we read all the assessment. Remember the nursing process, assessment, diagnose, then the plan, okay, the planification with goals and planning what to do. Then carrying out, carrying out intervention, see, after planning, action to take, and then evaluating, evaluation of the intervention. So first we do the diagnose, the center, then we move to the pertinent interventions that have been planned, and then we evaluate the, 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 the consequence of our intervention and the evolution of the disease. So this is the philosophy of those questions. So let's choose for the center which diagnosis is the most probable. Bell's palsy, no. Hypoglycemia, no. It's ruled out by the glucose. Ischemic stroke, yes. UTI. We don't have evidence of UTI. We only have evidence the patient is incontinent. So we are going to choose to move, to move ischemic stroke. So this is going to be moved here in the real test. So now let's see two actions that could be pertinent for this specific client based in what we found and the diagnosis the patient had. We have administered oxygen at two liters per minute via nasal cannula. Considering that the patient is having a hypoxemia and the brain tissue is having you know, um, hypoxia, could be a possible intervention. Request a prescription of oral corticosteroid. We never heard that in ischemic stroke, an oral corticosteroid would be indicated. So this is not related. Insert a peripheral venous action device. I'd like to have a peripheral venous action device in this client in case, in case of an emergency. So I'm, I'm not yet deciding, but I like to have a peripheral venous action device. Obtain a urine specimen for urine analysis and culture and sensitivity. Uh, it could be indicated, but it's not a priority in this moment. If I need to choose between that giving oxygen and having an IV access, testing the urine for a possibility of urinary tract infection because the age of the client, okay, uh, can wait. It's not a priority. So I prefer the other one. Notice that we don't have in the assessment nothing that suggests infection, urosepsis, or urinary infection. That's why it can wait. Request an order for 50% dextrose in water to be administered intravenously. This is used when there is hypoglycemia and the patient doesn't have hypoglycemia. So we are going then to move these and these to these positions. And then let's monitor the evolution of this client. We have all parameters that should be monitored. No, we have the urine output, the temperature. The temperature is no priority. 
okay? It, we need to choose two parameters, the temperature and the priority, because we are not dealing with an infectious disease. Neurologic status is important because the patient is having a stroke. Serum glucose level is important because this patient is diabetic, but is having a well-controlled diabetes. Electrocardiogram is important because the patient is having a cardiac dysrhythmia. Temperature is not pertinent. And urine output is important, but is not a priority. Uh, because the client is not having fluid volume deficit, hypovolemia, or renal disease that requires a monitorization of the urinary output at this moment. So need to be between this. So no doubt that neurological status, because the main problem of the patient need to be monitored. So now be choosing between the glucose level that looks to be perfectly controlled and the electrocardiogram that is evident that the patient has a cardiac dysrhythmia that we assume that is an, an atrial fibrillation, but we don't yet have confirmation. Choose between these two. I, I leave the serum glucose for later, and the priority is going to be monitor the neurological evolution and monitor the cardiac dysrhythmia. Do you agree with me? Yes, Professor. Yes. So, yes, professor. We already practiced this kind of question before, at least with some of you, and we concluded that are fair, no, are relatively easy questions. Yes. The secret is to have the correct diagnosis. So this first step is vital to have the bow tie correct, because mistake at this level, of course, are going to 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 take you to select in, incorrect actions or incorrect para parameters to evaluate. Remember that these questions tend to give you partial credit. So you can have this correct. Maybe you have one of these wrong and one of these wrong, then you lose two points. But if you commit a mistake in this first step, probably you will choose wrong action to take and wrong parameter to monitor. So that's why it's so important, the correct diagnosis. Nevertheless, as far as has been seen, in the um, NCLEX uh, page related questions, bow tie, uh, uh, you know, example of question, and also the one that have been practicing in ATI, as far what I seen are very fair questions that with the knowledge that you have, you know, the average knowledge that MRU students have can perfectly survive with this bow tie question. The bow tie questions are part of the new generation questions. Okay, remember they are going to have like less than 20% of your test is going to be new generation. Around 80% is going to traditional questions, more or less. It's variable. It depends on how many questions you are going to, to, to answer in your test. But it's more or less the proportion, more or less the proportion. Okay, new generation around 20%. Okay, a traditional question, the question that have been all time, okay, 80%. So this is one of the examples of, but those are the ones that are called um, standalone. Okay, it are not unfolded, unfolding of a clinical case. You know, the others are, we already made one, the clinical scenarios, okay, um, case, uh, case studies in which we are going to have unfolding evolution, and we are going to have six questions of each um, clinical scenario. It's the other type of, 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 of question that we have been practicing until now. But this is, if you have a bow tie, okay, you have a standalone question, bow tie, is this the, the strategies that I suggest you to do to answer this type of question. ATI have a good question of, of, of this type. Your ATI. The other, the other book that you have, and you will be, you you, you should be uh, using is um, prioritization and delegation of la charity. That the last edition that is in our bookshelf. Okay, this um, this uh, 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 program, this uh, app that we have with the school, the bookshelf, have the last edition, the fifth edition, has new generation type uh, questions. 
The nurse is preparing to administer an aminoglycoside, gentamicin, estrectomycin, canamycin, nephrotoxic, ototoxic, are the main the main uh, aspect to monitor. Have others, okay, uh, muscle relaxation, etc., but are the, the most important. Which of the following lab test results should the nurse review before administering the medication? So probably it's creatinine, you know? serum electrolytes and serum uric acid. Guys, no, don't confuse uric acid with urea. Urea is different from uric acid. Urea is measured with the blood uh, BUN, uh, urea nitrogen, blood urea nitrogen, and it is elevated in renal problems, in renal disease, in renal insufficiency. Also, is elevated in dehydration. Uric acid has nothing to do with this and the kidneys. Uric acid are related with the gout, can produce kidney stones and tophile. So this is not related with the aminoglycoside. Hemoglobin and white blood cell count. Well, this is a, a, a parameter that is not affected by the, the aminoglycoside. Uh, serum ammonia level and serum glucose. Ammonia is something more related with the liver than with the kidney, so no. So need to be this. Blood urea nitrogen and serum creatinine, that's it. So it's a question that you answer straightforward basing knowledge, knowing the amino glycosides are nephrotoxic and autotoxic, and that's it. The nurse is talking with a client who is scheduled for endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography, ERCP. This uh, procedure is frequently tested in anchors. This procedure has been taught to you in your MEC search class. Is in the in the in the the syllabus of MEC search class in the in the second MEC search class, the, the second time that you take that in two hours as an outpatient department. Which of the following questions would be important for the nurse to ask? And they, uh, uh, how will you be getting home after the procedure? Of course, do you have access to a thermometer after you leave here? Of course. What allergy do you have? Of course. Are you wearing dentures? Of course. Do you have external hemorrhoids? No. For this procedure, you need to know anatomy. You need to know that a the liver, the liver is an organ, a big organ in the right upper quadrant of the abdomen that produce bile and expel this bile through a tree, uh, a system of biliary ducts that uh, gather, gather, okay, gather and form a common biliary duct. This common biliary duct has an storage here, that is the gallbladder, and uh, where the bile is stored, and then continues downward and communicate with the duct of the pancreas, the duct of the pancreas, and both, okay, open, open in the duodenum. So here is the pancreas. Here is the pancreas. Okay, the pancreas. Okay, here is the pancreas. And the stomach. The stomach is um, um is uh, the esophagus, the stomach. Okay, and then you are going to have here, okay, the duodenum. The duodenum comes here. And then this uh, common biliary duct and the pancreatic duct is opening in the duodenum. The doctor will introduce through the mouth, will introduce through the mouth an endoscope. So an endoscope will be introduced through the mouth. To introduce an endoscope of the mouth, the patient needs to give consent. The patient needs to be NPO. The patient will have anesthesia, local anesthesia, apply in a spray in the throat. And this is going to inhibit the protective reflexes that prevent aspiration. Well, protective reflexes are evaluated with the gag reflex. So the gag reflex is going to be canceled and null. 
and the patient will be sedated. So this patient is MPO, gave consent, is MPO, it is sedated, so it has sedation, conscious sedation, could be midazolam, a benzodiazepine, or propofol, an hypnotic, yes? And um, has anesthesia in the throat. And then the endoscope is introduced through the esophagus, passed through the stomach, and enters in the duodenum. So the endoscope is going to enter into the duodenum. Once the endoscope is in the duodenum, is going to produce is going to produce a catheter a catheter that enters in the common biliary duct and once there is going to inject is going to inject um is going to inject iodine is going to inject iodine retrograde so backwards inside the duct of the pancreas and inside, okay, the biliary duct. So now all the interior of all these ducts are going to be filled with iodine. And then they make an X-ray and they are going to see if there are, uh, you know, gallstones, there is obstruction, there is a tumor, so anything that could be pertinent to see in this X-ray. So what are the implications of the ERCP? First, patient need to be having an endoscope. So MPO, give consent, MPO is going to be sedated. So it's important that cannot drive back home, which is an ambulatory procedure, as is said here. So how will you get home after the procedure is an important question. The other question is, are you MPO? The other question, are you allergic to iodine? Yeah. Uh, it, it could be pertinent to ask if it's a woman, uh, could you be pregnant? Because x-rays are going to be used. Okay. Uh, after the procedure, the patient is going to be in recovery until the sedation you know, wears out. And the patient cannot eat or drink until the gag reflex return. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, if the patient has dentures, the patient during the introduction of the endoscope can displace the, end, the dentures and then the dentures can go to the trachea. The trachea is here in front of the esophagus and then the patient can choke. So it's important to ask for dentures. Yeah. And, um, and after the procedure, when they remove the endoscope, and they ended, okay, uh, the procedure. You need to know that this manipulation, this, you know, touching, this, 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 this uh, disturb that occurs in this internal duct can produce one infection because you are, you know, you are coming from outside, going through the mouth, going through the through, through the throat. This is flora there the esophagus, the stomach, and then you are going to enter in a sterile area. Two, you can have bleeding because trauma, uh, biopsies, etc., can produce bleeding after the procedure. And three, very important, and I had this question in my ankles, okay? I think it was in the LPN ankles, okay? You can have inflammation of the pancreas. You can have abdominal pain because pancreatitis. Because this manipulation of the pancreatic duct can produce pancreatitis. It's rare. It's a remote possibility. But nurses need to be aware that after the procedure, pancreatitis, and after the procedure, the client should be monitored for potential complications that include aspiration until the gas reflex return, recovery of the consciousness after the sedation wears out, but not allowing the patient to drive, monitorization of signs of infections that is main, mainly monitored with the temperature, so it is pertinent, monitorization for bleeding, which is monitored with um, the viral signs, and monitor for, of potential pancreatitis, which is monitored uh, uh, by the presence or not of abdominal pain. So this is the, the complication that need to be monitored.
hemorrhoids have nothing to do with this part of the GI system. Hemorrhoids are too far, okay, of this to 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 concerning, okay, um, the client. So ERCP is this procedure. They say endoscopic. Why is called endoscopic? Because they do endoscopy. You know that this is endoscopy. When they introduce a, a tube with a fiber optic and they can see the interior of the organs. Retrograde. Why is it called retrograde? Because they inject the iodine backward against the normal flow of the bile and the pancreatic juice. And when we introduce something backward, okay, it's called retrograde. It's like driving back, no, going back. Uh, cholangio, because this all this biliary tree is uh, is is denominated is 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 called col cholangio, okay? cholangio, and pancreato because this is the pancreas. So you see the the biliary duct and the pancreas and an X-ray graphy. That's why it ends in graphy. So that's why it's called this way, and this is what is done in this procedure. That's why uh, they are exploring if you know the procedure and understand that they can change the options. They can put a gag reflex uh, monitorization. They can put a uh, need of consent. They can put, okay, many uh, other um, alternatives that I mentioned before, bleeding, uh, pancreatitis, et cetera. Are we good? Can I move? Okay. The nurse is assessing a client who had cardiac catheterization two hours ago. The most common uh, approach of cardiac catheterization is through the groin, uh, the, the femoral artery. The femoral artery uh, can be done in the arm, but is the most commonly, uh, you know, tested through the femoral artery because the femoral artery gather in the iliac arteries and the iliac artery in the aorta and then um, the aorta ends in the heart. No, so uh, here is the, the left ventricle, the, 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 the aortic valve. You have here the beginning of the coronary arteries that go to the to the heart, okay, the coronary artery. Okay. Remember that here you have the, the arteries that go to the brain and the arteries that go to the upper extremities. No, okay. A little anatomy helps a lot, okay, helps a lot. Help a lot, so this is usually so they need to make a, a little hole, a little puncture in the femoral artery. The femoral artery, of course, continues okay, continues to the lower extremity. So the foot and the leg depends of this femoral artery. Okay, very good. So which of the following findings what requires immediate follow up? So what can happen when they make a puncture in this artery. Two things can happen, okay, especially after the procedure, because the nurse monitors the client after the procedure. You are not present generally during the procedure, it's after the procedure. Well, this puncture can bleed. If this puncture is bleeding, it can form a hematoma, a tumor of blood that can produce making a lump in the groin, okay, a lump in the groin, Okay, a lump, a, 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 yes, like a tumor, okay, in the in the in the groin, or even can you know bleed out, and then you can have ble blood visible. This is one possibility. The other possibility, the other possibility is that there is no bleeding, there is no bleeding, but the manipulation of the of the of the artery produces a clot inside the artery. So inside the artery, a clot, a clot forms. When a clot forms here, is 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 forming gradually, no? It's forming gradually, uh, 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 and is going to um, obstruct the normal blood flow toward the the the, the extremity. Of course, producing ischemic pain, producing coolness. Producing coldness, producing um se llama, paleness, and decrease arterial pulses. So we have a blood pressure which is 104 over 70, which is normal. Okay, tend to be to the low, but uh, it could be the 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 base blood pressure of the client. 
if they say the client had before the procedure 140 over 80 and now has 104 okay i would be concerned because i see a tendency to the to decrease but this blood pressure is normal okay so a person having this blood pressure is not the concern okay and they they are not telling me that the patient had before a higher blood pressure. So this is a distractor. They put, you know, the systolic of a young person, something like this, and it's a distractor. This is one pulse, pillow pulse. We said before, we said before that two plus is the normal strength of the pulse in a peripheral pulse. So one plus is a decreased pillow pulse. If you have in a unilateral, so asymmetric in the side of the puncture, a pulse that is one plus, and in the other extremity, two plus, you confirm that this one plus probably is consequence of the puncture. And the main possibility is that a clot is growing inside the artery. So it is very, very concerning. Heart rate 98 is normal. And during output 100 milliliters in two hours, 50 milliliters per hour, which is normal, is in the range of the normality. So uh, ruling out the other options, the answer is number two. Remember the um, um, cardiac catheterization because it's commonly tested in England. The nurse has taught the parents of a nine years old child who has been newly diagnosed with bacterial conjunctivitis. Which of the following statements by the parents indicate a correct understanding of the teaching? Okay. The infection produce. I'm produce, sorry to interrupt, Professor, but sure. the last question was D, correct? Uh, you say four? Yeah, yes. Four is, is correct. If you okay. pee 50 milliliters per hour, you are good. Okay. Because no 100 in two hours is. 50 m ml per hour. This is, this is good. The average uh, output of a normal is between 30 to 60 milliliters per hour is the average, okay, urinary output. What never can be below 30 because it translates, okay, fluid volume deficit or oliguria. But you, you pee more than 30 usually. In general, is between 30 to 60, more or less. Okay, so this is the, the usual range of urinary output per hour of a normal person with an adequate hydration. The problem with that it is less than 30. It is normal. 50 per hour is in this range. So um, con bacterial conjunctivitis. Okay. Um, bacterial conjunctivitis. Which of the following statements by the parent would indicate a correct understanding of the tissue? The infection produces a profuse watery discharge. I should clean my child's eyelid and eyelashes with soap and water prior to instilling the medication. My child's eyes may be sensitive to light until the infection resolved. The prescribed corticosteroid eye drops should be used in for one week. We are going to look for the correct option. The correct option. I want to show you something. No, this is not what I want to show you. Let me see. Okay, here is it. I want to show to show you something. Image. Okay. Okay, I want to show images of bacterial conjunctivitis. Okay. The bacterial conjunctivitis produces mainly a purulent thick secretion in the eyes. Okay. It is a very thick secretion okay, in the eyes. Uh, it's different from the classical pink eye that produces a watery. Okay, secretion. The bacterial conjunctivitis produce, produce uh, a purulent secretion. 
the viral conjunctivitis that makes the pink eye produces a watery, okay, uh, clear uh, thing. Uh, but the bacterial conjunctivitis produces a thick, purulent drainage that even dries and prevents um, uh, the opening of the eyelid. So uh, it's something to have that in in in, in mind. No? So here's the make the differentiation that the viral is the pink eye. It's the you know you don't have this pure in this charge. It's, it's it's a watery discharge. It's it's a a, a, a tearing of the eyes. Bacterial the pure in that you are seeing. It just I wanted to reinforce with image because it is uh, it helps a lot. The viral conjunctivite, the pink eye, plus a watery secretion, a watery secretion, you know, a watery okay secretion, you know, a watery secretion. No, it doesn't produce this uh, purulent okay a drainage. Okay? It's important to differentiate that. Okay, it can be really disgusting the secretion. Okay, remember that uh, one okay any bacteria staphylococcus um pseudomonas any bacteria can produce bacterial conjunctivitis uh by the way in all people because abnormalities of the eyelids and you know problem of hygiene is not rare uh but remember that in 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 sexually active individuals a uh, chlamydia and gonorrhea those bacteria that produce um sexually transmitted disease can infect the eyes producing a okay, purulent conjunctivitis. Okay, so uh, it's important to to have that clear. This is the viral pink eye, no? Uh, and well, this is a little strange because it has a perilimbal. Okay, so it could be an uveitis. But, well, forget it. Okay, uh, I just wanted to to comment that because I'm not very sure of the right answer of this question. This client has bacterial conjunctivitis, so I'm going to discard the first one because it is a pink eye. This is a, a viral conjunctivitis. I know that the eyelids must, mandatory, being clean, being washed before administering the antibiotics eye drops. But always, uh, because the, uh, we practiced this question before, Okay, there is controversy if we use soap or not. Um, the photophobia, the photophobia, um, is much more common. Okay, present in the viral conjunctivitis and the bacteria that could be present, and I know that corticosteroids are not used in bacterial conjunctivitis because are going to make the infection worse. Okay, so definitely assure you that one and four can be ruled out. Okay, so now I have a conundrum here. I know that this is okay. I need to clean my child's eyelid and eyelashes, okay, with soap and water prior to instilling the medication. And uh, I have an option that I know that photophobia, sensitivity to light, is more frequent a mention in viral conjunctivitis than in bacterial conjunctivitis. And, um, uh, you know, translates more um, uh, other kind of inflammations in the eyes. And I need to choose what is more correct. What is more correct, okay, because it is and it is have, uh, you know, our contention. What do you think about this? I want to hear opinions. Number two is the correct one, Professor. Yeah. yeah. Always the, the students, you know, uh, question me because, you know, we should not be using soap in, uh, in the eye of children. But I know that there are soaps that are not irritant to the eyes because I, I remember using that in my children when they were small. And a part of that, I every day, sometimes twice a day, I close my eyelids, my eyelids, and I wash my eyes, okay, okay, with soap and water. Because when I wash my face, okay, I wash my soap. So 
I always think that if I were in my anchors, I will answer in that. Okay, because okay, this photophobia is not classical in the bacterial conjunctivitis, and we saw those people there with the eye eye lids very open, without you know having this uh, squint. Okay, um, eyelids because photophobia. So I don't see the problem in washing. Close your eyes, okay, and then you wash carefully from in to out, okay, with soap and water. Okay, so it is contentious, but this is. This is uh, the, the same answer would be choose by me. What I cannot do is applying eye drops with those eyes full of secretion. And remember that if the client is uh, using contact lenses, need to remove the contact lenses uh, along all the period of uh, the, the disease. We cannot add eye drops in clients with contact lenses. Okay. The next, the nurse is talking with a client who has diabetes mellitus type 1. Remember, type 1 is the one that appears as radically without, uh, you know, family members suffering of diabetes. And is the one that appears in younger people than in older people. Is the one that appears in people that are thinner than type 2 and is a very acute and unstable form of diabetes that depends only of insulin, exogenous injections of insulin, and that have the tendency to decompensate very quickly with dehydration and metabolic acidosis because diabetic ketoacidosis. Okay, so it's always the acute form of diabetes in comparison with type 2, which is more the chronic form of diabetes. So the nurse is talking to a client with that diabetes type 1 and is using an insulin pump. Insulin pump. We need to have a little about insulin pump. Which of the following, st following statements by the clients look at follow-up? So what is wrong in the statements? They see, I need a bolus dose of insulin prior to a meal. It could be correct. I should refill the pump with a short acting insulin. It could be correct. I can decrease serum glucose monitoring to twice daily. It is doubtful. I will, cha I will change the infusion needle every two to three days. This is correct. The insulin pump has a needle a needle that is inserted with a sticker and is connected to the pump with a catheter. This needle is inserted generally in the subcutaneous of the abdomen while the pump is warm in the in the in the waist belt that the patient is 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 using. So this needle is left there inserted two to three days. So this is correct, and we are looking for the follow-up. These uh, pumps, the traditional pumps, okay, are very expensive, by the way. Not the new ones, the traditional. And just go to the traditional, the stuff that, you know, approve Medicare, et cetera, insurance. Okay, uh, this pump uh, uh, can be programmed by the own client. The own client will have from the doctor and a sliding scale. You know what is in sliding scale from from uh, 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 70 to 110, uh, 110, zero insulin from 111 to 130, uh, three units of insulin from 131 to 160, uh, five units of insulin, 165 to, to 200. 190, uh, seven units, and this way on. Yeah, this is an sliding scale. The client has in this insulin pump a rapid acting insulin, usually Lispro, Lispro or Aspart. Okay, is a rapid acting, but could be also regular. Okay, and before each meal, before each meal. So the client should be having breakfast, a, a, a 
snack and mid um, morning, lunch, a snack and mid afternoon, a supper, and a snack before bed. Before each meal, the client must check the blood glucose minimum five times per day. Minimum five times per day. This is the usual, okay, in, in clients with type 1, 1 diabetes. And then before lunch, they have 140. So 145 units of insulin. So they come here, program five units of insulin, push a button, and the pump injects in the subcutaneous of the abdomen five units of insulin. But they need to check the blood sugar the accurate check before each meal to decide which amount of insulin is going to be administered in these bolus okay, prior to each meal. So that's why uh, I need a bolus dose of insulin prior to each meal is okay. The insulin that is used is the rapid acting or short acting, but what cannot be correct is I can decrease the zero glucose monitoring to twice daily. Still in an experimental level, there are new pumps that can be um, um, checking continuously the blood glucose of the clients. Okay, yes, probably you heard that. It is not in Enclus. Enclus is not with experimental last uh, minute or last on time new devices. It's the traditional device. So the patient that have a traditional insulin insulin pump should be checking the blood glucose before each meal to decide how much is going to be the bolus of insulin prior to a meal. Is clear that? Anybody has doubt? Are we okay? No, we good, Professor. Okay, you got the idea. The nurse, uh, by the way, uh, other options that have been in English about insulin pump is one is expensive. Okay, the, those insulin pumps are expensive. Can be used in type one, but also can be used in type two. There are some clients with type two that have very difficult to control uh, diabetes, and it's not true that is exclusively used in type one. It's not true. Can be used in type two. Even can be used in um, let me say gestational diabetes. Okay, so this is another question have been anchored. The other question that have been in anchors is that this kind of pump decreases the risk of hypoglycemia. It's paradoxical, it's weird, no? but it's true. People that are using insulin pump have less uh, episodes of hypoglycemia than people that are not using the, the, the insulin pump. The reason is that the, the control is better, okay? It's more stable. It's not this uh, a, a roller coaster that is a classical thing, you know, that you have hyperglycemia, then you inject a, a big dose of insulin, then you have hypoglycemia and you become happy and you have cake, and then you have again hyperglycemia and you inject insulin and then you have hypoglycemia and you have two hamburgers and, and you know, so this is the explanation for that. The nurse is caring for a client who is scheduled for a spinal fusion in one hour. This is a surgery that doctors, the orthopedics doctors, uh, spine surgeons do in the vertebrae uh, to manage um, a pinch nerves, uh, scoliosis, uh fractures uh problems in the in the uh, vertebral column in the spine and problems of compression of nerves etc okay which of the following situation would require follow-up if we're going to have surgery in one hour let's see the nurse notes that the client signed the consent one week ago no problem guys there is no um expiration of the consent unless the conditions have changed. When when a client give consent is giving consent for the type of surgery, for the place of surgery, for uh, the surgeon, the surgeon that is going to do the surgery, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Meanwhile, any of those parameters have changed, 
the consent given by the client and signed by the client and the client is not uh, canceling the consent is valid. So there is no expiration date for the consent unless the client cancels the consent uh, or uh, there is a change in in the details of the procedure. So no problem with that, okay? There is no limit of time established for the, the validity of the consent. So no problem with that. We are looking for the problem. We are not looking for this, okay? So it is not. The nurse determines that the last analgesia the client received was yesterday afternoon. I don't see any problem with this because any place say that the patient is in pain. Okay, so I think that doesn't require follow up because if the client uh, needed the last analgesic yesterday, it because now is not in pain. I don't see the problem in this. The client states, I need to find out why the surgery is needed before I sign the consent form. So obviously it is a problem. The client is not sure, has um, still questions about the procedure, so this requires follow-up. You need to talk with the client to see what is the concern, and then probably you need to refer the client to the physician. The nurse administers the prescribed preoperative sedation after the client signs the consent, which is okay. There is no problem with that. The client states, I am afraid to sign the consent form because I know I'm going to die during the surgery. This yes, poor, that one is, 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 is a big problem. No, it's, it's, the poor client is, is thinking that he's going to die during the surgery. So obviously it needs to follow up. You need to talk to the client to see what is happening, why he has those thoughts, and probably even the doctor need to intervene to talk to the client the client because with this feeling with this statement the client cannot go to the surgery and the last say the client states the surgery may result in some paralysis but the resolution of the pain is worth the risk to me what means that that the risks of the surgery has been disclosed to the client the client knows the potential risk of having a spine surgery. So, but the patient is in such a pain, in such a chronic pain that is voluntarily assuming the, 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 the low risk or the potential risk of having some type of paralysis. So this is correct. I don't see any problem in here because it's a client that knows the possible risk of the surgery. So this is the way that I would be answering this question if I if I were having my anchors. And this is the rationale that I explain. I those 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 topics that are very easily uh, explained to 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 gain time and speeding up okay the the explanation. But if you want to intervene remember okay you can intervene any moment. The charge nurse must transfer a client from a locked psychiatric unit to an unlocked unit in order to make a bed available. So try to understand the question. In psychiatric units, the clients that have problems, the, the, the difficult clients, the clients that can be you know, with problems of elopement, problem of aggression, uh, mm, mm, abuse of substances, etc., are in lock unit that to enter there, you need to, to be authorized by the nurse and the people in the unit. And an unlocked area are people with lower, lower needs, okay, with less risk uh, than the other one. So trying to understand what means this question. Now the charge nurse needs to move one client from the lock, I mean the, the high care psychiatric unit, to a lower care unit, okay? Because need a available bed. So the question say the charge nurse should recommend for transfer the client with. So which client is the most stable, the least, um, the easiest to manage to be moved from the lock unit 
to a lower care unit. Depression, who has suddenly become more animated and involved in unit activities. When they use the word suddenly, be very careful. Because this is not translating the expected progressive gradual improvement of a patient with depression that is responding to the treatment. When they mention the word suddenly, you need to suspect something. So what what do you suspect in this client that we discussed before? That the per, that the person is planning to hurt himself or um, suicidal ideation. This, this client has already decided to commit suicide. This is what happens, guys. Incredibly true. Is it is really really true? I can assure you that. Is what happens when a person who is severely depressed take the decision of committing suicide. There is a sudden elation, a sudden improvement in the mood because the patient is going to feel uncontrolled. The patient is going to feel that is free of suffering. When the patient decides when and how, it becomes suddenly okay, elated, suddenly, um, you know, improvement. So it is a client that requires more assessment that you suspect that is, is having, uh, you know, so I don't like, I don't like, okay, this client, okay, uh, to be transferred is my suggestion. This concept is frequently present in anguish. Bipolar 1 disorder, who is experiencing a maniac episode. Remember the maniac is a patient that is difficult to manage because maniac clients have tendency to become violent. The, the maniac client is the one that can be very happy and laughing in this moment, but then if somebody, you know, uh, uh, gives the contrary, so, uh, uh, you know, opposes to uh, his um, uh, desires of the, of the, this uh, grandiosity, delirium that they have, then um, becomes very, very upset, becomes violent. So a client in maniac episode, this robbing, laughing, okay? Okay, is laughing in this moment, but in, in, in 10 minutes later could be fighting with the client, okay? It's not an easy client to be transported. So it's between three and four. I have a schizophrenia who is withdrawn and require assistance with ADLs. What is assistance with ADL? Okay, the patient doesn't, doesn't shower and you need to, to take the client for a shower. The patient doesn't want to, to brush the teeth and you need to, to, to deal with the patient brushing the teeth. The patient is uh, ignoring the food, so you need to deal with feeding. The patient is, uh, is soiled, you need to change the, you know, the, the cloth, et cetera. Schizophrenic clients. Most stable have, client in this case will be four, right? Yes, it looks like this, the most stable. A patient with a schizophrenia can have this evolution. Some, not all, but some clients with a schizophrenia can evolve with the years to a such deep degree of destruction of the personality that they are like a, they, they look like a dementia, you know, looks like a patient with dementia. So it's, it's, it's like a patient that needs to be assisted in everything. But you can delegate that to a, a UAP and unlicensed assistive personnel. As CNA, I can do, I can care of this client because it's not, it's not violent, it's just withdrawn, it's not having social interaction. And basically what needs that? The last client is dementia, but it's delusional and it have paranoia. What is the problem that the patient is, is, is have a delusional idea of being poisoned by the doctors and the nurse? It's a very difficult client because it's delusional. How you get this client it? How you convince this client of taking the medication is going to be more difficult. So it is easier than this. So I think that I'd answer this client and I'll assign this client to a CNA and it's a patient that has not initiative or volition 
it is the term of this initiative, there's a motivation to 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 do anything is basically negative symptoms, not positive symptoms, negative symptoms so is loss, 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 loss of, of stuff and need total care. And total care, we, we, we can give total care to, to clients. Let me review. No, I think I can improve that here. Okay. Yes. Okay. Another um, another um, new generation style of question that is the the new generation style of that apply question. Okay. Um, the nurse in the emergency department is caring for a ten days old client. It's a baby. The flow she says hmm, intake. A 10, 480 formula. A 14, 60 formula. 18, 60 formula. So, how many ounces is this between 3, 3, 4, 26? Oh my goodness. It is a, a lot of, okay. So, here is 2 ounces and 2 ounces. I think it was a mistake. Okay, how can drink four hundred <laughs> a pint of formula at ten? Okay, so it is half a liter. It is okay. A pint of formula is too much. It is okay. Two ounces is okay. Two ounces every two hours. But my goodness. I don't, I think there is a mistake here. Okay, output, three small yellow stools, no measurable. Uh, 40 milliliters emissions at this time, and 40 milliliters emissions at this time. Why is vomiting? Why a baby of 10 days is vomiting what is drinking? Obviously, there's a mistake, so probably it was 40 milliliters formula. Okay. Okay. Cannot be 480 milliliters of formula, guys. Impossible. It is a, it, it is a, uh, 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 two cups of 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 formula. Two cup of war of formula. Uh, my goodness, uh, 16 ounces. Uh, do you have an explanation? Do can you explain me that? Maybe that's why he's throwing up. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I, I can. Guys, the, the, the stomach of a child at this age is not tolerating more than three ounces. It's, it's, it's limited to 90 milliliters, okay? Uh, of, of, you cannot have 400, you know? It is, it is, my goodness, two cups of formula. It's impossible. So it is a mistake, and that's why throwing up. Yes, no, no, this throwing up in a baby of 10 days, I need to think in pyloric stenosis. I'm not sure, I have not yet okay, reached this question. I, don't, I haven't seen this question yet, okay? But uh, I'm suspecting that the baby is vomiting after each feeding because pyloric stenosis probably. And here probably it was 48 milliliters. It is a mistake. Nurse's note. Parents report that the client has been vomiting after drinking each bottle of formula. Parent estimates the client is vomiting half of each bottle with each feeding. Client triaged. Vital signs temperature is okay. Pulse is okay for a baby. Respiration rate, respiratory rate is okay for a baby. At 14, client experience projectile. See, another factor that makes me suspect. Um, Pyloric stenosis, projectile vomiting, which is characteristic of the pyloric stenosis, 30 minutes after drinking 60 milliliters of formula. Anterior fontanelle is soft and flat. If the baby is dehydrated, the fontanelle is sunken. Okay. If the baby is okay, the fontanelle is flat. Bowel sounds are hyperactive. Maybe it's the stomach fighting against the obstruction of the pyloric valve. 18, client experienced projectile vomiting 30 minutes after drinking 60 milliliters of formula. Abdomen is distended. Is the stomach with a distension. 
client is crying and inconsolable, but probably is crack. I think that is crying because it's, it's hungry, because the poor child is vomiting everything and is not absorbing, so it's, it's having hypoglycemia. Okay, but okay, I don't know why there is relation. So I'm, I need to suspect with this scenario that the child is having pyloric stenosis. So the question say, which of the following diagnostic procedures should the nurse anticipate the physician will order cellular apply? Barium enema, no, because I'm suspecting, remember the pyloric stenosis, the esophagus is okay, the stomach is okay, but here the valve, the sphincter that communicates the stomach with the duodenum is uh, too tight, and the food that the baby is drinking is not passing here, so that's why the baby vomits. You are going to have the stomach, okay, having peristalsis, trying to overcome that, and you palpate in the right side of the umbilicus. The umbilicus is here. This is the pure palpate, a olive shaped mass which is no more than the hypertroph hypertrophic okay, pyloric valve. The baby is at the risk of dehydration. The baby is at the risk of hypo hypoglycemia and malnutrition because it's not absorbing, it's not passing to the intestine, all the milk is at the risk of dehydration, is at the risk of electrolyte disbalances, is at risk of metabolic alkalosis because it's vomiting a lot, is at risk of aspiration because frequent vomits okay, produce aspiration. And the baby needs a surgery, but before the surgery need to be verified the pyloric stenosis. The barium enema definitely has nothing to do with this condition. An abdominal x-ray can show too little, but can show, can be useful, and can be ordered. It's not going to harm the baby. Can show a distended stomach because the stomach is full of air, and then you see the air in the stomach, and can rule out, okay, uh, gas or distension of the intestinal loop, so it is okay. The other test that could be done is the abdominal ultrasound. The abdominal ultrasound is a good, 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 good test to diagnose, to diagnose um, pyloric stenosis. Is the, the, practically is the, the most commonly done test to identify the hypertrophic pyloric valve and localize the pyloric valve to make the little incision with local anesthesia to make the little okay, um, opening that they do, they cut some fibers of the pyloric valve that is just there under the skin. And this is a very easy, um, and at this age, at this in this moment, the surgery is done by the surgeon. So abdomen ultrasound is okay. Complete metabolic panel, okay? It includes electrolytes, includes glucose, etc. Is indicated. Is indicated. The uh, endoscopy, the esophagogastrodenoscopy, is not uh, necessary to diagnose pyloric stenosis, only if there are doubts to that. So I prefer to leave that blank because it's not indispensable to do a esophagogastrodenoscopy in, because it's an in, in, invasive method that is requires sedation and is not indispensable to do the diagnosis. Okay, the uh, the endoscopy is not going to 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 add any interesting information to what is seen in the ultrasound, which is not invasive and doesn't require to okay, get sedation, etc. So this is what I know about this um, this pathology. So now this is a type of question where um, where um, with the scenario you need to suspect a diagnosis. 
if you suspect the diagnosis and you know where is localized the pyloric valve, the hypertrophic valve, then you know this. Uh, and, and we mentioned that the consequence of vomiting can affect the parameters measuring the complete metabolic panel, including the electrolytes, etc. And uh, abdominal um, ultrasound is the test of choice for this. The abdominal X-ray can give information to rule out other intestinal obstruction, etc. And the because the esophageal gastroendoscopy is not a, is not a routine in the pyloric stenosis because it's invasive, requires sedation. I prefer to leave that empty. Remember that um, that a wrong selection can cancel a correct selection. So it is uh, it is um, a recommendation in those cases. The nurse in the emergency department is assessing a client with multiple injuries. Just a moment, guys. I think not take a note here. Okay, the nurse in the medical department is assessing a client with multiple injuries that occurs as a result of a motor vehicle collision, it's a polytraumatized client. Which of the following findings should receive the highest priority? It is a question, of course, of prioritization. All the findings could be important, but one is the most important. Avulsion injury of the left index finger. When you say this word avulsion, is that almost okay, all the finger has been severed. So the finger is hanging there uh, through a, a little okay, piece of, of, of flesh. Okay. Uh, deep laceration of the right forearm with blood oozing from the surface. Oozing is a little. Mm, amount, a little drop, a little trickle of blood coming out is not a, a massive hemorrhage. Hematoma on the left side of the neck. So hematoma is like a bruise, okay? It's a lump and like a bruise there. Open fracture is a bone that penetrates the skin and is protruding in the legs of the right tibia and fibula. What do you think is the priority here? Three. Number three. Okay, I agree with you. Okay, they selected number three. And I agree. I used I used to say, guys, you need to respect the neck. Because the neck is a very delicate area of your body that communicates your heart with your brain. You know, you have your head with your brain. Then you have your neck. And then you have your trunk. And then here you have your heart. And you know, you know that you here in your neck, you have two arteries that brings most of the blood to the brain are the carotid arteries that are susceptible of being traumatized, of laceration in a neck trauma. Also, you have okay, um, two big veins to uh, jugular vein okay, that come down here, okay, that also can be uh, traumatized. Here in the neck, you have something very important that is your airway. So your airway is in the neck, okay, the airway, the side, the pipes through which the air is entering. And also behind all this, uh, you have a very important stuff, which is the um, spinal cord, the cervical spinal cord. So your cervical spinal cord, okay, you know that is a very delicate because if you have an injury in your cervical spinal cord, you have paralyzed all the body from the neck down. Even you can have problem to breathe. So notice all the critical structure that you have in your neck, your airway, the carotids that give the circulation to the brain and the vein of port to train the, this blood that goes to the brain, a um, the airway and the spinal cord. 
So now we have a polytraumatized client that has many trauma, but you have a, a hematoma. You have a hematoma here in, in, in the neck. So from where is coming this blood? Would be coming from the carotid, laceration of the carotid, laceration of the, como se llama, of the, the jugular vein. But those are big blood vessels that are related with the brain. But what happens is the hematoma is growing, is going to compress the airway. And a part of that, if you have a trauma able to produce laceration in the carotid or the jugular vein producing the hematoma, also this trauma could be producing a fracture in the cervical vertebrae that could in any moment displace and produce a, uh, you know, a section or interruption of the cervical spinal cord. So neck is critical guys is critical also when you have surgery in the neck you need to be very careful like surgery the thyroid because you know all this stuff can could be happening in this surgery so that's why i agree with you that the answer to this question is true totally they don't have received information about assigned client the nurse should first assess the client so the, another question of prioritization. Um, the nurse should first assess the client with multiple sclerosis who had an indwelling urethral catheter removed five hours ago and has not been able to urinate. So this client that have a neurogenic bladder because multiple sclerosis frequently is associated with neurogenic bladder. A neurogenic bladder is a bladder that cannot contract efficiently to empty the urine and sometimes requires indwelling catheter. But they, the client had a, 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 a polycatheter, but they removed five hours ago the catheter and the patient has not been able to urinate. So the most probably that is happening in this client is that urine is accumulating in the bladder, okay, in the bladder, and uh, the patient probably have the full bladder, not very full, but you know, five hours is not so much, so much uh, time without urinating. You can be five hours without any of you can be five hours without urinating easily. Uh, so it doesn't look to be a priority. Can wait. It's very different if you have a patient with a spinal cord injury and, and, and previous spinal cord injury above T6 that could be having a urinary distension and could make an autonomic dysreflexia. But they are not talking about this patient. They're talking about a patient with multiple sclerosis, which is a chronic demyelinizing disease of the nervous system. The second, with an abdominal, abdominal aortic aneurysm, an AAA, who reports recent onset of low back pain. This is the classical description of what is called dissecting, okay? Dissection, dissecting aneurysm of the aorta. The aorta is a pipe, is a hose that has many layers in the wall. It's like an onion. It's like the onion has many layers, no? Many layers. Okay. And uh, the aneurysm, in the area of the aneurysm, in the area of the aneurysm, the layers are weakened are weakened and easily can be uh, separated. So the layers can be, the layers that can be, uh, you know, attached one with the other can be separated, separated by the blood. And this separation, okay, of the layers, the walls, weakens even more the aneurysm, making an imminent risk of you know, or bursting and a massive hemorrhage. 
this dissection, this separation of the layers of the wall of the aorta by the, the uh, blood under pressure that could penetrate uh, uh, under the endothelium uh, uh, is very painful. But because the aorta is stuck in the abdomen, it is uh, near the spine, the vertebral column, the pain is felt in the back more than in the front and radiates to the buttocks, to the, to the butt and to the thighs posteriorly. But it's a very intense pain is generally the of sudden onset when the dissection starts. And, uh, you know, it's something very serious. I think that the answer of this question is this. Let me see the others. Patient who had a coronary artery bypass, okay, has an open heart surgery, a cabbage, or, you know, they remove a vein of the legs and put that as a bypass in the coronary arteries that was partially obstructed. Two hours, two days ago, so it has, has survived two days, so it's a stable. And reports external pain with coughing, which is suspected because the poor sternum has been open with a saw, <laughs> with a butchery, uh, you know, a butcher saw, okay, to, 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 to see the heart. So it is expected. It is expected. A uh, patient who has bacterial pneumonia, and is requesting cough suppressant, so cough is expected. So obviously the answer is number two. Uh, be aware of the diagnosis of dissecting aortic aneurysm. It is a straightforward uh, question. The nurse that care for a client with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease who lost more than 10% of ideal body weight has been named in a lawsuit charging negligence. So this nurse is, has been sued, okay, because a patient with a chronic pulmonary disease has lost 10% of his ideal body weight while under the nurse care. So there is a duty. Could be a breach of duty, and there is a harm. So let's see what could save this nurse. Which of the following entries in the client's medical record would help refute the charge of negligence? So what can uh, protect the nurse of being liable of being having a breach of duty. Let's see. The client has been instructed to eat three large meals daily. Mm, I don't think so. The client has been encouraged to maintain a high calorie, high protein diet. I think it's the same. The client has been encouraged to drink fluids with milk to promote digestion. No, because it produces okay, uh, uh, anorexia. The client has been instructed to exercise 30 minutes before eating, um, before eating to improve appetite. Hmm. Okay, uh, eating a three large meals in a patient with COPD is not recommended. The patient with COPD when eating a big meal, okay, a patient with COPD that has, you know, uh, a lot of air trapped in the lungs. If it's a big meal, it is going to produce distension in the abdomen and elevation of the diaphragm, producing more, um, you know, uh, shortness of breath. So it's better to the, for the client to eat uh, five to six a small meals, a small meals, but of high content of protein, calories, high caloric and nutrient concentration or density meals, but a small and more frequent. So this is not a good recommendation. The client should not um, consume liquids with the meals because now the liquids are going to take a space in the abdomen and the client will be full so sooner 
So uh, that's why the nurse should recommend drinking the liquids needed during the day between the meals. So this is not correct. And the rationale is that what I'm explaining. So now it's between the client has been encouraged to maintain a high calorie, high protein diet. And the client has been instructed to exercise. OK. Uh, before eating, it means that it's going to exercise 30 times at least three times per day, which is too much, especially in a client with a chronic condition, respiratory condition that is losing weight. We recommend okay, 30 um, minutes of exercise five times per week. But it is every day exercising 30 minutes three times per week. So this is not logical because it's going to make the clients lose too much weight. So that's the strategy that I'm using to choose number two as the best option to um, document and could protect the client, the nurse, that the, the client's losing weight because the disease, not because of uh, the recommendations of the nurse. And the nurse cannot oblige the client to eat. So I think that number two is the best option. Any client with anorexia, any client that doesn't want to eat, you recommend small meals, but more frequent. Of course, the quality of the food is important, should be small meals, but high density of protein, calories, vitamin, nutrients in general. You don't recommend drinking liquids with the meals because now the patient is going to be full of liquid instead of food, you know? And uh, you recommend the liquids between the meals. And, you know, uh, even if exercise is okay, if you exercise be before eating, the exercise is going to activate your sympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system doesn't promote digestion. It's the parasympathetic nervous system the one that promotes digestion. So the meal should be associated with rest, not with exercise. And the exercise promotes weight loss. Okay, so it doesn't make sense. So that's why the strategy to choose number two has been that. So I insist in, in, in demonstrating you how I would be, you know, deciding okay, options in a test because sometimes we are not 100% sure what the question is about or what the options are meaning. But then if we carefully, okay, rule out what we know, we can, uh, you know, reach the best possible answer. And this is the best strategy they can do, okay, in your test. The nurse is documenting care for a client who had peripheral venous action device inserted 10 minutes ago. Remember, peripheral venous action device is the one that nurses can insert in the forearm. Which of the following will be the best example of correct documentation for the nurse to include in the client's medical record? It is a client of question with very frequent in English for documentation of something, which one is the best? 22 gauge catheter inserted in the right hand. Secure the side with paper tape to avoid skin tears. Infusion started slowly due to report of coolness at the side. Label side tubing and intravenous fluid bath. This is a routine. Those three options are routines that are not providing interesting information. The nurse that comes after you in the upcoming shift doesn't care about this routine, which is a, is a, is a BS documentation. Yeah, it's not helping, it's not giving information. What the upcoming nurse needs to know, the size of the catheter, because for example, is, is in need, the client for transfusion doesn't, 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 work, so I need to take a new IV. 
and where this catheter is. So the best documentation is what? The one that is pertinent, the one that is precise, the one that is detailed, the one that is giving uh, you know pertinent and interesting information. The other ones are routine, okay, that is not providing any kind of interesting documentation. This is common sense. This is not knowledge. The nurse is caring for an assigned client. It would be most important for the nurse to monitor. Okay, so let's see. It's a priority to monitor, to follow up, to ongoing uh, uh, assessment. Serum lipase labels for the client with hypercholesterol, cholesterolemia. Right, the client with hypercholesterolemia. What you need to monitor is the cholesterol. Not the lipase. Lipase is an enzyme that is present in the pancreatic juice. And precisely as its name says, is to digest the fats of your food. This lipase abnormally is spilled in the blood when the pancreas is broken. When the pancreas is broken, it's called pancreatitis. So it's useful for the diagnosis of pancreatitis. So it's a nonsense. ABGs, arterial blood gases, so pH, CO2, bicarb, and PO2, result for the client who has acid-base imbalance. Makes sense. You need ABGs to evaluate, to monitor acid-base imbalances. Serum glucose level for the client with diabetes insipidus. Diabetes insipidus has nothing to do with the glucose. It's a nonsense. You monitor sodium, you monitor um, you know, electrolytes and hydration, clinical hydration in diabetes insipidus and urinary output and urine specific gravity, but never glucose. So no need of glucose. ACTH, this is adrenocortropic hormone producing the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland inside the skull produces a hormone that control and stimulate the cortex of the adrenal glands that are above the kidneys, that this cortex produces cortisol, which is, is, this, is a, glucocorticoid, a glucocorticoid, corticoid, and an aldosterone, which is a mineral corticoid, aldosterone. So the ACTH, adrenal cortex tropic hormone, okay, stimulates the cortex of the adrenal glands to produce this and to produce this. And it is not tested in client with fluid imbalance, like fluid volume excess or fluid volume deficit, because it's not pertinent. It is tested when they problem with Cushing or Addison disease. So nonsense. So obviously two is the best option. This is another strategy that I recommend. Sometimes you have an evident answer of the question. Please don't ignore the other option. Read the other options and convince yourself that your initial selection is correct. Sometimes I had a lot of surprises when I go to the other options, say, oh Lord, it's not the one that I selected. This is, you know, more important. Okay. But obviously, uh, the most important, okay, it is uh, number two, because the other ones that doesn't make any sense. The nurse is planning a staff education program about collaborative conflict resolution strategy. Oh, those are the question of management where you have, okay, um, Two uh, members of the staff that are in conflict are fighting, and how you um, could solve that. Which of the following would best? Hmm, I hate those questions. Would best describe implementation of a collaborative conflict resolution strategy? I don't have any idea of what this is what it is, but let's see. Resolution is a strategy to solve conflict in a collaboration way. Let's see. A staff nurse is working with the nurse manager 
and offering suggestions about an upcoming new procedure. I don't see the conflict here. There is no conflict there. The staff nurse is working with the nurse manager and offering suggestion about an upcoming new process. I don't see the conflict. Number two, the clinical nurse leader is flattered by being asked to help create a clinical ladder for nursing staff members. I am so happy that you are taking me in consideration. I don't see the conflict here. Guys, help me because remember, I don't know that uh, uh, um, this is a, an area that I'm a perfect ignorant. Third, the charge nurse, charge nurse is working with the staff nurses and the nurse managers to develop shared goals and plan for the new staff format. The charge nurse is working with the staff nurses and the nurse manager. I think that something is missing here. Intervene to develop shared goals and a plan for the new staffing format. It could be a conflict. A conflict before between the charge nurse and the nurse manager. It went with the staff nurse and the nurse manager to the ah oh, no no ya va. The charge nurse is working with the staff nurses and the nurse manager to develop shared goals and a plan for the new staffing format. The last one is a new nurse has offered to work on a holiday in exchange for having the following weekend off. Oh. What do you think, guys? I think it's three, Professor. I think it's three. It's yeah, number it, three, I think. It, it looks three. like it's number three. It's three. Yes, it's where the conflict should, could arise in uh, collaboration could okay on um, collaboration could help to overcome the conflict okay number three do you know i have a philosophy okay i don't need to get a hundred in the anger to pass <laughs> i i don't need to know everything i need to be the safest possible uh, for my clients I like to have basic knowledge to be precisely safe for my clients, but I don't need to know everything. For example, this is an area that I personally don't enjoy management, okay, uh, and leadership, because I'm, I'm, you know, uh, I like, I like, I like the hands-on, okay, uh, stuff with clients more than management, okay, and so. Uh, if we are wrong, I think that nobody is going to die. No, any patient is going to die if we are wrong on that. So I can give away this question to the English, okay, as a gift, okay, to our, you know, uh, nice, uh, uh, you know, people writing English questions. Okay. The near, but the common sense, the logical is that is where the conflict could uh, um, arise and, and you can collaboratively between two members of the team uh, solve the conflict. The nurse is caring for a client who lives with a spouse and two adolescent children. Thanks God, this is not anymore my case. They are adults, okay? And the client has been admitted to the hospital for treatment of tuberculosis, hmm. active tuberculosis. So the spouse, and the children are uh, exposed because they live with the active tuberculosis. The local health department has been notified about the client diagnosis. The nurse should recognize that after this notification, the local health department will, let's see, a scheduled periodic examination of the client chest and sputum. The client is going to be hospitalized in airborne precaution and is going to receive at least antibiotics simultaneously until three sputums becomes negative. And then it's going to be discharged 
and then is when the client could be scheduled periodic examination. Contact the client family to arrange for family members to be examined. It is necessary. Immunize, we don't use that here. We don't use immunization for tuberculosis. Immunize those persons with whom the clients are being in contact. There is not immunization for tuberculosis in America. Be the, um, the vaccine or the bacilli of Calmet getting BCG is not used in America. Isolate members of the clients in middle of the family at home until diagnostic studies rule out TB. There is no need of that. Because if the client has been exposed, probably are going to have a latent tuberculosis. The isolation for tuberculosis must be done in the hospital. You don't isolate client with tuberculosis at home. So it is a distractor to make me commit a mistake, to screw the, the question up. So probably those this spouse and the adolescent children probably will have latent tuberculosis. Quickly, immediately, the Department of Health will contact the clients and are going to be tested. They are going to have a PPD, okay, a PPD of Mantux test done, okay, and um, if the PPD is positive and X rate and sputum. If they are latent tuberculosis, they are going to be treated with. Uh, chemoprophylaxis, is on side. If they have active tuberculosis because the sputum is positive, they are going to be treated the same way as the father. Okay, so there is no isolation at home. It doesn't exist, okay? So the right answer is number two. The nurses participating in a community-based disaster drill. Mm. The nurse should give priority for treatment 2A. So what is the priority? Two years old with a bleeding scalp laceration and briskly reactive pupils. It's okay. 15 year old who is restless mm -mm, and has distended firm abdomen. Could be critical. 30 years old client who has a leg wound exposition of femur a blood pressure 120, 76, and a pulse that is stable and wait. 60 years old client with heart failure, whose pulse oximetry is 92%, is okay on room air and respiration 26 is increased, but the priority I think is number two. So the two priorities are this and this. Of the two priorities, the one that can have more unstable is a client with an abdominal trauma abdominal trauma that have abdomin abdominal distension and, and contraction of the muscles. So it's a board-like uh, uh, abdomen and is restless because maybe is having hypovolemia, hyperperfusion, et cetera, and the brain is affected. So this is the first to assess. The second is this, okay? And then uh, you um, cover the this one and send the client to be evaluated by the orthopedic. And then um, we uh, uh, see the, the laceration in the scalp of the, of the child. The nurse is in a community-based setting, has received the following telephone message. The nurse should first return the telephone call to the parent of A, so priority of a child because our parents. Three-year-old child who sustained a concussion and was irritable when awakened every two hours during the night. You need to awaken the child every two hours to do neuro check. You allow the child to sleep. Okay. Some people think that we cannot allow clients that suffer a head trauma cannot be allowed to sleep. It is wrong, guys. It is testing in English. We yes allow the patient to sleep, but you awaken. Okay, you arouse the client every hour, every two hours, every three hours, depending on the, the timing of the ordered neuro check, to do your neuro check. You evaluate pupils, you evaluate reflexes, you evaluate movement, you evaluate uh, response, and then you allow the patient to fall asleep again. Of course, if you 
uh, 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 you know, arouse or, or awaken a child every two hours is going to be irritable, is expected, is going to be uh, upset. So this is not a priority. If, if the concussion was sent home, it because severe complications were ruled out. Okay, a four year old child with impetigo contagiosa who has eruptions spreading around the mouth and nose that are draining thin yellow fluid. It is expected. Impetigo is a benign infection of the skin, very contagious, contact precautions, produced by strep streptococcus or staph, staphylococcus, and spread easily. Okay, that's why the child must have the hands uh, washed frequently, the nails sh uh, uh, cut, trim, and uh, antibiotics are administered. Okay, and produce this secretion, a uh, yellow secretion, when dries up, producing the classical honey, honey color, honey color crust. Is because it's expected. This is not a priority, I think. I think. Five years old child with Ewing sarcoma. It is horrible. It's a bone cancer. Who is receiving external radiation and the irradiated area appears regnant. It is expect expected in the skin where the radiation enters into the tumor. The prognosis is not good. Six year old child with a right long leg cast whose Toes on the affected extremity are swelling and cool to the touch. It looks like it's a compartment syndrome no? because the cast is too tight. And this is the priority. It is expected. Everybody is agreeing, no? Okay. The nurse is. Okay. The nurse is teaching a client who is receiving newly prescribed clopidogrel. Could be a ticagrelor or pasru grel. Is all a family and all them have been tested in English. Notice that they have in common these syllables. Okay? This syllable is, is, is common. Okay, clopidogrel, ticadrelor, pasru drill. Okay, drill. Okay, and take care because sometimes have been ticadrelor, sometimes pasu drill, sometimes clopidogrel. This is the most common, the, the plavix, but it is an antiplatelet medication. This antiplatelet medication decreases the plate aggregation and in some way uh, decreases the uh, possibility of formation of abnormal or undesired clots. Which of the following information should the nurse include? Notify your primary health care provider if you experience unusual bruising. Oh, yes, of course. Unusual bruising should be reported. So, okay. And is the include okay. Avoid taking over the counter OTC medication containing acetaminophen. No, take acetaminophen instead of any other medication like ibuprofen or aspirin, etc. So acetaminophen is the type of OTC that they can use for pain, fever, etc. So it is incorrect. Avoid driving your car for a short time for a short time until your response to the medication is known. You recommend this, you recommend this if the medication produces sedation. Medication that could produce sedation or dizziness, like a blood pressure medication, like uh, anti-allergic medication, like antidepressants or uh, you know, anxiety medication, etc. We Teach the client A, don't drive until you get used to this medication that can produce, okay, sedation and, you know, 
uh, decrease reflection resp response, uh, etc. But no, no, no clopidogrel. They don't affect. No, they, they don't produce. They don't produce sedation. It doesn't apply to this medication. Have a blood specimen obtained every three months to check serum album levels. They had nothing to do. So obviously, it's number one. And this is the end of the document that I want. I really wanted to discuss with you, not because it's necessarily the question that you are going to have in your ankle, but the style of questions are going to be similar. And the NCLEX, when they publish this example of test, it's because it's a person that that is having a hundred and a hundred and thirty questions, a hundred and thirty question test, okay, and is more or less the proportion of questions that they are going to have in a usual test. And there are different type of questions. Some questions we are easily finding the answer. Some questions are more difficult. If you are well prepared, you will find the test very fair and you know of an acceptable game. Okay, um, an acceptable um, um, isness. Guys, um, uh, you should have, okay, and if you don't have that, talk to your professors and, and your IT uh, uh, people that are in charge of assigning you your um, your accounts of books because you should have you should have okay in your account faculty MRU you you should have okay I'm on your book assign this book, okay? And this book, okay? Prioritization, delegation, and assignment, fifth edition, fifth edition, is having, okay, new generation questions. All the questions are important because, um, You are going to have by chapters one chapter to paint cancer immunological problem for electrolyte blah 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 so by system you can find question of prioritization and question of delegation and assignment which is an important part of your English and then you are going to have okay um you are going to have um, several new generation questions of this content of this area that is good to practice okay and this is same okay so for example you are going to have something like this this is an, a new generation type of questions related with um delegation scenario an older patient with earlier stage alzheimer's disease sustained a hip fracture after following so early alzheimer's probably this is the stage that i'm now okay uh the patient is still uh independent okay but fell and had a hip fracture he has been discharged and is returning home to live with his wife. He qualified for home health visit through Medicare. The home health team includes an RN, an LPN, a physical therapist, a social worker, and a home health aide. So the, the CNA that, that works in the home health uh, team is the HHA, no, a home health aide. Which member of the home health team is best to assign to or delegate for each intervention? So now you have the intervention and you need to choose the member. So let's see. 
assist the patient to take a bath. You have the RN, the LPN, the HHA, you have the physical therapy, social work. So obviously, I, if, 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 if any, uh, you know, everybody agree that is the home health aid, the one that can assist the patient with um, ADLs, baby. Administer prescribed medication, okay? So we assume that the prescribed medications are going to be taken at home. Is anything IV push? So, so obviously, what is the best here? The, the LPN. The LPN can pr pr provide the medications of this client. Now, assess patient's memory and level of cognitive function. Who do assign this function? RN. You say RN. Yes, RN. Yes, Professor. Okay. Teach patient and wife about memory aids. Teaching. So, which one? R and again. Assist the wife to organize the pills, the pill box for routine medication. Aren. Why? LPM. You can delegate that to the LPN. LPN. The LPN is giving the medication and also can you know help to organize in the in the you know what those are the pill boxes no, I have one I use only when I travel okay uh that's a Monday Tuesday for morning afternoon yeah the LPN can help organize that because the LPN is the one that is managing the medication is in the scope of the LPN trying to to you know assign the lower level that can do the the system. It is true that the RN can do it, but if you need to choose between the RN and the LPN, this activity is better to be given to the LPN to uh, re uh, release the RN of this uh, activity. That's why you delegate. That's why it's important to delegate. And remember that you are the one that is delegating and making the assignment. Assess patient strength, balance, and movement. LPN? LPN? Assess being LPN? No, RN. Oh, RN. RN. Is any Versus. other person is any other person here that could be more trained or okay. specific for movement, strength, and balance? Huh? Somebody said that's something that I, I didn't hear. Physical therapist. Physical, the physical therapist. Guys, if I need to choose between the RN and the physical therapist to evaluate, to evaluate how much can the clients move, how much can the client tolerate the weight or support weight, how much the client have a strength in the upper extremity to hold a walker, okay? Uh, I think it's a physical therapist. So, do you realize how you are going to be dealing with those questions? Yep. Accompany the patient for short walks in the garden. Home health. Home health. The the aid. The aid. The HHA. You can accompany the clients. Can hold the client through a bed um, a belt, a gate belt and knows all the details how to do that. Okay, teach patient how to use a walker and the bathroom hand raised, teaching. Again. Again. Again, you have two person that could be teaching the patient. Is the teaching of how to use a walker better taught by the RN or the physical therapist? The physical therapy. So could be the RN, but there is one better than the RN, physical therapy. So you need to choose that. Cannot be the LPN, cannot be the HHA, 
cannot be the social worker, but could be the RN or the physical therapist. If I need to choose who can teach me, which one is an expert in crutches, in assisted devices, in walker, in where to place the handrails of the bathroom, where to drill the holes in the in the in the shower to put the handrails. I think the physical therapist. Advise patients family about community resources. Social worker. Correct. Help patient and family to understand Medicare benefits and resources. Social worker. Social worker. Social worker. Assess wife risk for caregiver stress. Sorry, sorry, I couldn't hear you. Remember that I'm little deaf, little no, big deaf. And monitor for safety issues related to changes in behavior or safety risk in the environment. This is an assessment, but it is something called ongoing assessment. Monitor means that you are going to continue assessing the person along the time, along the future. Okay, so this is an ongoing assessment. So this ongoing assessment is not home health A, it's not physical therapy, choose a way because it's a very local okay, individual sort that has not to do with the physical therapy. So it could be the RN LPN. or the LPN. 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 Can be LPN. delegated to the LPN. For ongoing assessment, you can delegate this kind of assessment to the LPN. Okay. And then, of course, or I did that in the morning and I did correctly in the morning, but you know, uh, um, I knew the answers. Okay. And then here you have the rationale. I just wanted to, to, to practice this question with you to, um, to see that if you can, um, Okay, because you should have a sign in your in your bookshelf uh, this uh, this book because I, I I know that this book has been assigned in the school to the students the charity. I have a sign in my bookshelf in in the school. Okay, so you need to have this assign also. And this book has the the ¿cómo se llama eso? The, the the number the 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 clue the the, the code to access. Those are uh, interacting okay, uh, activities, but the book also reading the book, you have the question written in the book and you can practice that in the book. OK, so these are our example of you are going to apply the same old knowledge, the same always uh, the, the knowledge of from always, but in a new style of questions that is called me new, new generation. OK. Uh, uh, a question where that uh, make you face more um, practical approach of the real life scenario of a client in the hospital in the in the, in the house etc where you are going to take decisions of clinical uh, clinical approach clinical decision clinical judgment okay so this is what I have for you to do, to motivate you with the, the la charity because I love this book. Even if I fight a lot of this <laughs> this book, because sometimes I don't agree with the answer, but you know, anyway, it is uh, it is uh, stuff. Okay, so as just to motivate you to find out uh, if you have this resource assigned, that probably is yes. Any question? You have any question for me? No, professor. But professor, I have uh, one uh, like two questions. Can we review next week or like whenever you want?